Lately, one thing I've been thinking about is how everything is becoming a subscription these days. Cloud storage for photos, ChatGPT, especially Google services. So in this video, I want to share with you the apps and solutions that I found. So hopefully they will be helpful. If you want to save money and stop having your data and privacy leaks, then definitely watch until the end of the video. The first thing is the best browser. For years, I've used Chrome, but for the past year or so, I've basically stepped off the Google train and only use Firefox. I think Firefox is a great browser that everyone should switch to, especially if you're using Mac. It has a way better performance. There's not that many memory leaks compared to Google. Firefox has almost all the extensions that Chrome has. Unlike Chrome, it has privacy built in. It's not sending all your data and searches to Chrome, and you can customize it a lot further. In Firefox, they have built-in settings where you can block trackers and not share your data with different websites. So I would definitely recommend turning that on. The reason why these companies want to track you is because if they know everything about you, they can hyper-target ads that cause you to buy. So a lot of times it will just end up in you wasting money. The second thing that I changed is my default search engine. In Firefox, you can change your default search engine in the top bar to not be Google. And one common search engine that is more privacy focused is called DuckDuckGo. I do like DuckDuckGo and I do occasionally use it, especially since there were specific times where I could not find a link in Google, but I could find it in DuckDuckGo. But I found that DuckDuckGo results are generally not as good as Google. But my default one is actually this one called Perplexity, which is an AI search engine. What Perplexity does is that it searches a bunch of different resources and then synthesizes a complete response for you. A lot of times I found it to be a lot more precise and detailed than Google search. So for example, if I search up Quentin Tarantino movies in Perplexity, it actually gives me this really organized layout where I can see each movie, I can play the trailer, I see the Rotten Tomatoes rating, and this kind of result isn't built into Google. So this is an example of how Perplexity is a lot more detailed and more efficient than a Google search. With Firefox, if you wanted to do a regular Google search or DuckDuckGo search, you could still easily do that just by typing at DuckDuckGo or at Google, uh, even at YouTube. But also related to AI, I also started to look into whether or not it was possible to continue to use AI without giving these companies my personal info. So the next thing is AI chatbots or LLMs. If you use ChatGPT or any other AI regularly, you can try asking it for a detailed summary of everything it knows about you, or even ask it to tell you something that you don't know about yourself. And it's actually pretty accurate. It's kind of scary. And I tried to look into whether or not it was possible to install a local ChatGPT on my MacBook, especially since I have the M4 Max, which is one of the most powerful chips that Apple sells. So it turns out there's a bunch of local LLM models that you can download and run on any computer. So it's basically just limited by your computer's processing power. I downloaded this open source one called Llama with 7 billion parameters. And I also installed this local interface that just runs in the browser similar to ChatGPT. And it's totally offline. So none of this gets sent to any servers and I can ask it any secret questions as I want. And this model, 7 billion parameters, is pretty good. It runs super fast, super smoothly, but I found that at times it would start to hallucinate, especially if the chats get longer. And that didn't really happen when I used ChatGPT regularly. So after looking into it further, it turns out that ChatGPT 4.0 uses something like 2.7 trillion parameters, and this only runs 7 billion parameters. So with this UI and my M4 Max, the best model that I can get it to run without lagging is the 7 billion parameter model. It turns out after I got pretty deep into the rabbit hole that there is a way to run a 70 billion parameter model locally without lagging too much on the Mac, but it only works in the terminal. And the reason is because you have to do some setup to actually use the Apple Silicon. I got it working with an alias. If you're interested in how to do this, then let me know in the comments and I can write up a blog post. But if I type LLM in my terminal, then it will run this 70 billion parameter model, which is actually far more accurate than the 7 billion parameter model that I use. So yeah, I'm pretty glad that I set this up on my Mac. The way that I see it is that it's a super powerful offline Wikipedia that I can use at any time. If you have stronger computers laying around or or you want to make this a weekend project. I have seen people online that they use a bunch of Mac minis and run a super powerful model, but uh, I don't think I'm going to do that just yet. As far as I'm using AI, I think the 70 billion parameter model is pretty good. The next thing is cloud photos and storage. So this is something that I started to think about more lately, but I recently had to upgrade my cloud storage for Apple photos because I hit the max limit. I used to use Google Photos when I had a Pixel, and then about six years ago, I switched to an iPhone. Right now, it's not that bad. It's like 10 or $15 a month, but I can easily imagine in 20 years or so, 
if I just keep continuing to take photos at the same rate, I might have to pay for like 20 terabytes of storage, which might have astronomical costs. And it's not like I'm on a daily basis going back to all my old photos and looking at them. Like I actually rarely look at them. I was really interested in seeing if there is an alternative because my photos and videos are also kind of segmented in Google Photos and Apple Photos right now. And I found a few solutions. So the first thing is that if you store things yourself locally, it's not even that expensive. For the same price that you pay for a cloud subscription, you can just get an SSD or hard drive and pretty much just store that forever. The only problem with that is that there's no user interface to look at your photos or search your photos. They would just all be in a folder. And that's where this application comes in called Imish. So I tested this out and I haven't decided fully if I'm going to jump ship and use this. But this is basically a Google Photos clone that has no subscription fees and you run it yourself. All the photos are just locally on your computer in a folder and you can browse it through this interface that looks like Google Photos. You can search for photos, it has facial recognition and a bunch of other features. And you can set up your own server, like if you have a spare laptop or computer, you can just keep that running, keep that plugged in and you can actually sync it from your phone the same way that you use Google Photos or Apple Photos automatically. Like they have a Android and iPhone app, which has pretty high ratings. So I'm considering doing it as a weekend project, like taking an old MacBook Pro, setting up as a server, and then just using that as a way to back up all my photos. Another thing I've been doing over the past few years is that I started making physical photo albums for the photos that I take. This really started since I got a film camera a few years ago, but I actually think that having physical photo albums probably has longer longevity than digital hard drives. There's no risk of getting hacked or your hard drives corrupting, and it's super nostalgic to look at them and it's easy to pass down. I think it's kind of similar to journaling with a physical notebook. I actually go back and look at my journal entries, whereas whenever I take digital notes, I rarely go back and look at them and sometimes they get lost. But that leads me to the next one, which is note taking software. Even though I like using analog systems and I journal regularly using a physical notebook, it is still pretty necessary in this modern age to have a digital note taking system. A lot of the most popular note taking apps require a subscription fee and it is pretty much a deal breaker for me because it means that you don't own any of your notes and a lot of times you can't even use them if you're not connected to the internet. I've been using this note taking app called Obsidian since early last year and I still think it's the ultimate note taking app. You can just download it and use it on your computer and you don't have to even make an account. All of your notes are just stored locally in a folder on your computer so it's basically just a really powerful text editor with a bunch of extensions and organization. If you want to sync them across your devices you can do that with GitHub for free. You can set up your own server or they have a service where you pay them something like $4 a month and they'll sync them across all of your devices. All right, next I wanna talk about business related apps. I think one of the biggest culprits for subscription fees are apps that target businesses because a lot of times they're just a business expense and you won't think twice about signing up for something that is something like five or $10 a month. So if you run a business or you have a YouTube channel, I'm gonna share three business apps that I use that have no subscription fees or tracking. The first one is a replacement for Loom. So for a while I was using Loom, which is basically just the software that lets you make a quick recording and send it to someone, but it costs something like $15 a month to use it. And it really just has that one feature. So there's this open source software that I started using instead called Quick Recorder. And it does pretty much the same thing. It just saves a file locally on your computer and you can share that or send that however you want. The second is an app that tracks your business assets, income and expenses. So I use one called Manager.io, which is a free accounting software, and I think it works pretty well. It's a little bit manual, like you have to import your bank statements, but once you set it up, you can easily print profit and loss statements, track how much you've made, and also your company assets. So the third app is what I use for to-dos. So having a to-do app is really useful, especially if you have deadlines and stuff that you need to schedule way out in the future. And the one that I use is called Things 3. I talked about this a few times on this channel before, and I actually made a whole video in my video memberships about how I use it. But the reason I like this app is because it's a one-time payment and there's no subscription fees or tracking or anything like that, which is pretty different compared to a lot of to-do apps like Todoist, there are subscription fees. The only downside with this app, I would say, is that it's locked to the iPhone ecosystem. With to-do apps, there are a lot of open source alternatives, but I haven't found any that work just as well as this, especially because this app works even on my Apple Watch. And so I don't have to have my phone out if I wanna add a to-do. So the next thing is algorithmic feeds. So on this channel, I've talked a lot about the benefits of being more intentional with the content that you consume, especially with removing algorithmic feeds. And the reason is because with algorithmic feeds, they 
they hyper target you and show you content that they know you'll enjoy, which often leads to a lot of rabbit holes or impulse buying. And so one thing that I've set up lately is to create a custom dashboard. There's this open source dashboard called Glance that is on GitHub, but I set it up as my new window page. So with this, you can set it up to have your subscriptions from YouTube and RSS feeds that you follow, the stock market or even GitHub repositories. You can basically customize it to be whatever you want. I find it to be a lot more intentional. With YouTube, for example, I think it's a lot more intentional than using the default feeds, which can easily suck me in for hours. I don't think all subscription models are bad. So one habit I'm doing whenever I sign up for something that has a subscription fee is that I sign up for a month and then I cancel it immediately. If you cancel the subscription immediately, it will immediately give you a discount. So you can actually save a lot of money by doing this. That's it for this one. I'll see you in the next video. Let's get it.